All right, let's go because you know what I came in to do. I don't get paid for overtime. I'm here to fight. Realistically, has he got any chance? We've got 30 of seconds. He has. Of course he has. Um, look, it's a tough ask, of course. You know, the thing with Usyk is he doesn't depend on his power to knock you out. He depends on his skill. That's why it's a tough ask because he's going to box rings around you if you let him. Dubois, good luck. Don Charles, good luck. Great British boxing, good luck. We potentially might have a heavyweight championship back on our soil. So, Mr. James Ali Bashir has joined Team Dubois to aid Daniel in his challenge against Alexander Yusek. Now, who is James Ali Bashir? Some of you may ask. He is Alexander Yusek's first coach as a professional who took him to the world title and was shelved by email or text by Yusek after they won the title. No explanation, but that was that. I saw Mr. Bashir at the press conference in Poland and he and Yusek embraced each other. All seemed to be good. Yusek is six, six and old. And he's really number three in the world. I want to get him to the number one spot. Yeah. It is best to be careful because when you box him, boxing is a two-lane highway. You know, you get to driving crazy, something run right into you, you know? Yeah. And you looking up at the lights. So, I need to ask you this, um, Alenga. That fight is still on the cards. Because he went the distance with Lebedev and he gave him a good fight. So, you're still looking towards that match there? But he's still a tough guy. Like, Yeah, he's a tough guy. He's a reckless guy, you yeah. know? He's a very reckless, strong guy. You still looking at him as an opponent this year? I mean, he's, we rated number three in the WBO. It doesn't make sense to fight him now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We, after we get a belt, you know, when we look in the unified belts, I'm sure that they're going to meet somewhere along. He's a strong guy. He's a tough guy. Usek is much smarter than him. I'd have Usek to box him until the steam ran out of him. You, sometimes you got to take the steam from these guys. You know, you can't just run out there the them guys like the brave guys, strong, wild guys like Malinga. He's a gambler. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because when he took that guy's yeah. head off, that top Eastern Bloc amateur's head off, man, like, I was like, oh. Yeah, he's a tough guy, but that's why they call boxing the sweet science. I've got nothing but respect for Mr. James Ali Bashir. And I don't just randomly give my elders respect. They have to, you know, be about something. But elders like that, nothing but respect, you know what I mean? And he popped up on my hangout the Sunday after Joshua dismantled Charles Martin, a southpaw. And when it came up that the right hand is the counter for the southpaw, he reminded us that he was in the camp with Eddie Mustafa Muhammad in 1980 when he took the WBA title from Marvin Johnson of Southpaw. Now, Mr. Muhammad is another elder I have nothing but respect for. He gave me his time to give me interviews, nothing but respect. And this is someone I used to watch as a kid. And then to find out, you know, they're going to take time to give me an interview. It might not be a big deal to people, but to me, it means a whole lot because I love this sport. It means a whole lot. And in response to the right hand being the counter for the Southpaw, Mr. Bashir broke some science that Sunday. And he let us know this. No, no. For me, the way I was taught was to work your jab. Work the jab. Hit the forearm. Hit that forearm right there between the wrist and the elbow. Just keep jabbing that there. Jab that there and then bang the left hook. It was the left hook right hand, not yes. the right hand left hook. See, when you reach him with that right hand, you expose yourself yeah. to be counterpunched with a left hand. But it's more comfortable to faint the right, to, to faint the jab. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Faint the jab, then throw the right lead half-heartedly, and throw the left hook. You, the whole game plan is to land that left hook through the body. Here, write this down. You guys write this down. Then you can see what I'm talking about. See, that's what these trainers don't do. So-called teachers, they're supposed to be teachers, and they don't teach the guys. There's examples there. Go to YouTube and look at Eddie Mustafa Muhammad versus Marvin Johnson. And Eddie Mustafa will show you how to break a southpaw down. That's how you break down a southpaw, an aggressive southpaw. You break them down with body punches. You open them up with body punches. That's what you want to hit. You want to hit them body shots, you know? When you reach them with that right hand. But AJ was able to throw the right hand because his arms are long. And then you got a stationary target. Look like he looking for a stop sign or some shit. You know what I'm saying? He's standing there looking, and that grocery cart, that Amtrak, that train came right down the middle, right in the mouth. He grazed him a couple of times prior to that, you know? 
another thing they made a mistake. And I said this to you the, the other day we was talking. I said, the event is going to consume Charles Martin. So are these the tactics that he's going to bring to the camp with Don Charles and Daniel? Although he himself said that's how you break down an aggressive southpaw. So unless Yusek is going to change tack and look for the knockout on Saturday, Mr. Bashir might make a few modifications on his southpaw killing strategy. <laughs> I'm actually working on a two-fight deal with me and Joshua. Um, one up in uh, Saudi Arabia and the other one up in... Uh, we're going back to the motherland, Africa. In reality, I'm going to focus on the wilder fight for now. People are reading about one or two hurdles uh, arising in negotiations. What, what can you say about that? Things are positive, you know. We've got the off stumbling block. Fury's got to get past Ngani. Usa's got to get past the Bois. Good luck to both of them. Good luck to every party involved. And then uh, we can then sit down and kind of rejig things around. So the goal is to have Usyk and Fury potentially compete for the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship. Myself and Deontay Wilder, two big punchers, great fighters, been to the top of the mountain, slug it out and may the best man win. So it'll be a great event, potentially. So we're just waiting to see what happens and then finalize the devil in the detail. There's been a few people who've been running around like headless chickens just this week saying, or well, intimating AJ doesn't want the fight. What's giving you that idea is what I don't get. What is giving you any idea AJ doesn't want the fight? And I said on Twitter, I said, because I got it from a good source, a very good source, that they're not going to announce the fight until Fury and Nganu and until Yusek and Dubois have their fights. It won't be announced until then. And that's what AJ was saying just there to Sky Sports. The paint's barely dried on the hilarious knockout. And there's people screaming that AJ's ducking the fight. It's ridiculous. Like, I don't know what it is. I take it upon myself and say, niggas is gay. And no, if Fury or Yusek don't decide to go through with their fight, it doesn't mean Wilder and Joshua doesn't happen. The fight will happen, but they're taking it stage by stage. Fury and Ngannou, Yusek, Dubois. And then at some stage we'll get an announcement. But it's not all on Eddie Hearn and AJ to make fucking fights. And if the negotiations do break down, it's irrational just to point the finger at them as well. Wilder said he's going to get rid of AJ in three. But if it's the more confident AJ, it might last into the fourth. Wilder better start his road work. Better get that road work done. Because he might go more rounds than what he's planning to stay around for. And he might get tagged himself. All this big knockout talk. What all that big talk hot you're playing yourself. Denzel Bentley, the current British 160 pound champion. He has his opinions on Chris Eubank and Liam Smith too. Set for the... 8 Arena in Manchester on September the 2nd live on Sky Sports box office. Bentley provided his opinion on the highly anticipated rematch and believes Eubank's transformation and shift in style might prove challenging to reverse at his age. Denzel says it's going to be very hard to tap into that old style because he was a guy that was purely work rate. He's taken that away from his game. I think to go back to that at his age will be very hard, Bentley said. He said Smith is going to be too confident. He's going to be relaxed. He knows he can knock him out. Smith doesn't rush his work and look stupid. Smith is always composed and has a good shot selection. Denzel, he says he can't say whether it will be a knockout or points, but he's going for Smith to hurt him. And he believes Smith will win again. Well, Denzel is 100% right. A lot of people have told, or maybe not told Eubank himself, but they've said that he needs to go back to that volume punching that he did as a kid. Well, did that win him a world title? Nope. And youth is very instinctive. And what is instinctive to the individual, once it's lost, it would be hard to replicate if it wasn't taught or trained and ingrained into you. Recapturing youth, if it at all was possible in its entirety, would be the most sought after commodity in the world. He has to try and improve on what he's been doing with Roy. It's the new even though Roy won't be in the corner, it'd be stupid to stray too far away from what they've been practicing for the last couple of years. Now Eubank is in his 30s. The 20 plus year old Eubank can't make decisions for the 30 plus year old Eubank and vice versa. It all has to work in tandem. The momentum was lost after the James DeGale fight for Eubank. That's where the momentum was lost on the PBC, the inactivity. Can he become a world champion, not baby belt, not IBO? 
or anything like that. Maybe, maybe. But the ideal window of opportunity was then. He had a trainer. People were saying the girl was washed. Yeah, there was some slippage there. But you're dealing with a world champion who didn't lose his belt in the ring. Former Olympic gold medalist, a southpaw. Eubank still had work to do. And I try and watch what I say as I don't go in the ring and just diminish somebody's win. I have to look into it a little thoroughly before I do that. But that's just me. So we have to go back to 2017 since Daniel Wade, a similar weight. In his first four bouts, he weighed 2 3 1 debut, 2 3 2 second fight, 2 3 4 third fight, and 2 3 2 in his fourth fight. And then after that, 238, 240. Other weights he came in for the most part until today, 233, 25 years of age. Are they going for speed, or is this just um, a result of the punishing workouts he's put himself through and he's just ended up that weight as a result? Usek 221, just like he was for the two AJ fights. Nothing changed there. Usek, he didn't look that impressive on the skills, in all truth. I don't know what I'm comparing that against. Does he always look like that? Maybe the daddy physique is creeping in. I don't know what that tells us. Daniel, you're in the lion's den right now. A chance to create history. First off, you got a message for those fans watching at home. Yeah. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who strengthens my hands for war and my fingers to fight. Amen. Daniel, you've looked in his eyes for the last time. Daniel cut the interview off right there. A lot of people are theorizing he has never used Psalms before after a weigh-in that he's nervous. But listen, man, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Like, you do what you got to do to try and get yourself in the frame of mind for the battle. And if it's new, it's new. He could be nervous. And listen, being a little nervous, not, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Being overwhelmed by nerves, not good. But it goes the same with the confidence. Being confident is good, but being overconfident could also have negative consequences just as much as being overwhelmed by nerves. Regis Progress will defend his WBC 140-pound title against Devin Haney, and they're targeting November the 11th, according to Regis's trainer, Bobby Benson. So it looks like just a few loose ends to be tied up, and we'll have that fight on the zone, and I'll be grateful for that. Big up everything boxing. The PFL have three undisputed boxing champions, a female boxing champion signed to their roster. PFL is MMA. I don't know much more than that, but it's MMA. And that's Clarissa Shields, Amanda Serrano, and Savannah Marshall. Why aren't the likes of Canelo, Crawford, Tyson Fury, Inoue, current champions, good earners, trying to do MMA? Well, they're earning huge purses and they're selling out stadiums. Perhaps not Crawford, but, you know, he's doing big numbers. He's doing pay-per-view, 600000 last time against Errol Spence. And in Omaha, he's a huge draw. Clarissa and Savannah, they had a big blockbuster in the UK at the O2 Arena. Serrano did well against Katie Taylor in terms of numbers at the MSG. But without Katie Taylor, she has no chance of doing that anywhere in the world. And Katie Taylor... She came up on Anthony Joshua cards, I believe, Takam and the first Ruiz fight. And she was also on the undercards of the likes of Dillian White and Derek Chisora. That's how she made her come up on Matrim. She's the most bankable female boxer. And now the Irish boxing scene has opened up again. She's doing good numbers at the free arena. There was Chantel Cameron saying she wanted the rematch in Manchester. She doesn't have a say in it. Like, most female boxers don't have fan bases. They're dependent on men's boxing being successful. This boom period, which you could you could say started from Carl Frost, but I'm talking from AJ. If it wasn't for AJ and his success, you wouldn't see as much female boxing on the zone or matchroom. You just wouldn't. Opatai defends his IBF Cruiserweight title against Jordan Thompson, 30th of October, and Shannon Ryan's on there. She signed to 258 Management. The same with Ramla Ali. She signed to 258 Management. We wouldn't see these girls on the televised portion of the card if they weren't signed to AJ. Ramla is no longer with 258. I've been talking about British boxing potentially heading into a crisis, a boxing recession, if you like. One of the first casualties will be women's boxing because most of the boxers 
UK, US, they don't have fan bases. And I have a feeling them not becoming the stars they want to become in boxing, Clarissa, Amanda and Savannah, could be having a big influence in them crossing over to MMA. There's no male boxing champion in the prime of his career, in the prime of his earning power, who's switching over to MMA. When they asked Anthony Joshua, do you want to fight Francis Ngannou? He said no. Tyson Fury said yes. Even with him saying yes, Ngannou is coming over to his world. And Ngannou might want to test himself as a boxer. He may want to do that, but money. Money is the main driving force in him crossing over from MMA to boxing. All the talk about Alicia Baumgartner wanting out of her matchroom contract was crazy. Where's she going to go? I think top rank have two recognizable names. I think that's Iniesta Estrada and Michaela Mayo. Al Heyman Zero. Frank Warren, Raven Chapman. Ben Shalom has a good number of female fighters. But you can write off Frank Warren and Ben Shalom because they don't do cards in America. Where would Alicia fight in the UK? Her last fight was promoted in Detroit, her hometown by Matram. She wasn't leaving Matram. And he confirmed that, saying that they were looking to extend her deal beyond next April. She was never looking to get out of that situation because there's not much alternatives. And I tell you this now, if Sky and the zone reduce how much budget they're going to put into women's boxing is basically dead on a mainstream level and if there are to be any casualties and any cutbacks in boxing broadcasting the women are going to get hit because most of them just don't have the fan bases to make it a viable decision look at this like Jai Opatar defends his IBF title against Jordan Thompson on the 30th of October at the Ovo Arena Wembley. Look how much women are on the card. Maisie Rose, Shannon Ryan. There's another two girls here I don't recognize. Looks like they're going to be fighting each other. Ellie Scottney defending her titles. There's as much women on the card as men. The women need to look long term. You see, men in the professional ranks for years before I was born way before I was born have always had to think about selling tickets to their workmates to their families to their friends to whoever building a fan base and it's something that women in boxing professional boxing have to look at you can't just be relying on the zone and matrim and sky to be putting up the money there will come a time when a lot of women are going to have to justify their existence on the portion of the broadcast that's televised.